Yeah, I appreciate it, Mike. And because I thought a lot about it. And just really Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe um, we will see. And um, I really believe that this is a unique case. Um, you know, I, I think you can find um, some pretty obscure government, like an obscure government in New Zealand that kind of looks like this, but even then, yeah, yeah right. But um, even then, you have this, um, I think the absence of parties would also kind of make this play out a little bit different, even if you can find a good real world analogy. It's really undefined. Um, it's a little bit like, um, I really appreciate where the uh, Herd Review mission came from, but I also think there were, didn't have a lot of experience with day to day real world operations of governments. So the yep. role of the actual role of the mayor is really um, poorly defined. I would argue on paper, it's a weak mayor system, but if you have the right mayor, you can turn it into a strong mayor system. Um, which is probably not what they were trying to achieve. How is the uh, academic year going this year? We're back so in person. So we have a lot of happen. people back on campus. It's great. Yeah. Side so I, I started the useful. I start. Okay. I will start in a minute. Well, thank you for getting people back downtown. That's an important thing. We worked at that. We wondered what, what's the right blend. Everything now is a balance. Flexibility versus keeping the vital. Yeah, it's just we're trying to balance something. But it's been good to see people back down to the restaurants around here busy. That good list. Friday afternoon is not our strongest time. Yeah. yeah. Especially now that the rain has started. I think people are starting to cocoon again. The library. Is it library anymore? <laughs> it's been it was purposely redesigned. I was the dean, of course. I the, the amount of people actually using books yeah. declined so much that we thought this is such a beautiful and wonderful space that this is can be used during the day for people to so people come and study. And uh, we repurposed a lot of the wood into the shelves and things. I mean, you can say more side, but it's, uh, um, it's much more useful now, even though it was sort of hardy for those who used to the library. I think. But, and if you, <laughs> and you see what a beautiful room and view it is yes. when you get it open. So okay. Malcott Spirit is still here. Well, let's get started. Welcome to another in our series of panels inspired by the 50th anniversary of the Portland Downtown Plan, within which Portland State was designated an urban university, a university in and of its place. I'm Cy Adler, Interim Dean of the College of Urban and Public Affairs, and I will be introducing the moderator of today's panel about governmental reform, uh, PSU President Steve Percy, who was the Dean of the College of Urban and Public Affairs while I was Associate Dean. And when he moved up to the presidential suite, I became Interim Dean of the College. So Steve will introduce his panel members, They'll give their presentations, talk amongst themselves, and then we'll open it up for questions. And a reminder to Steve that when you who are with us today ask questions, Steve will repeat them so that the folks who are Zooming in will hear what your questions are. Welcome to our remodeled Dursay Moroni Toulon Library. A work in progress. We still need to have stuff up on the walls and the cabinets, but we're getting closer to enabling that to happen. 
thanks to members of the Dean's office for producing this event. Kaya Mendoza, Erin Sutherland, Sarah Violante, and Jonathan Wolf. And a special thanks to Sarah Violante for overseeing the transformation of the library. So, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to let you know that um, because it's Friday afternoon, and because uh, one panelist had to drop out, we're going to end at five o'clock. So you don't. So uh, um, little truth in advertising at the beginning that we're going to get you out a little bit earlier. I'm delighted to uh, be the moderator of this panel on the historical and contemporary perspectives on government reform in the Portland metropolitan area. And we have three wonderful panelists here to talk to us on those topics. I'd like to introduce them um, first. And first uh, to my immediate left is Carl Abbott, who retired a few years ago after teaching urban studies and planning at Portland State University over five decades, but not 50 years, over five decades. It's, that's, it's, it's, that's to note that in here clearly. And has also held endowed visiting professorships at George Washington University and the University of Oregon. He has written several books about regional planning, the history of American cities, and specifically about Portland. Professional service includes co-editing the Journal of American Planning Association and working with local historical and civic organizations, such as the Oregon Historical Society and our Architectural Heritage Center to develop public programs. He also contributes, contributes about urban issues and about science fiction for publications such as Los, An Los Angeles Review of Books, the Smithsonian.com Science and Bloomberg City Lab. Welcome, Carl. Dr. Michael Montoya, also on my left, serves as the Interim Director of the Office of Community and Civic Life for the City of Portland. Prior to this role, he served as the Strategy, Innovation, and Performance Manager for this office. Civic Life, Civic Life Office was founded in 1974 as a way for members of the Portland community to get involved with their local government. Today, our Bureau's programs continue to invest in building strong civic engagement, community leadership, and support all Portlanders. Dr. Montoya is a retired professor, which I think it's hard to believe he could be retired, but he's a retired professor of anthropology, in Latin, Latinx studies and public health from the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Montoya received his PhD from Stanford University, but received his most rigorous education from working within communities. His scholarship reveals the ways techno science, medicine, and complex organizations both erase and strengthen inequalities, especially of racialized and historically traumatized peoples. His work also illustrates how civic engagement is one of the best ways to com combat the erasures and the release of creative energies, the erasures and release of creative genius of communities. A fifth generation Oregonian with native and Mexican roots in New Mexico, Dr. Montoya is a first generation college graduate and knows firsthand the importance of government, government policies in creating equitable futures for all peoples. To my right, I'm glad to welcome Commissioner Maps. who took office in January of 2021. He is the commissioner in charge of the water at the city of Portland commissioner in charge of the water bureau, the Bureau of Environmental Service and the Bureau of Emergency Communications. I don't know how people put those all together into that, but you're the you're the environment water emergency guy. Yeah, he's also Perfect. liaison to the Travel Portland, the Visitors Development Fund and the Fair and Morals Claim Moral Claims Act board. <coughs> commissioner Maps was raised in the Bay Area and spent many summers with family. He followed family members and attended Reed College, graduating with a degree in political science, something we have in common. After he after Reed, he worked for Gladys McCoy and Beverly Stein, which inspired him to pursue a life of public service. Later, Commissioner Maps completed a PhD at Cornell University and returned to teach at Portland State. Prior to elected office, Mingus was a neighborhood manager at the Office of Community and Civic Life for the city of Portland. <coughs> He's also served his community as an executive director of community-based nonprofits. Commissioner Mapp's priorities are increasing public safety, decreasing homelessness, improving environmental quality, and ensuring equitable, uh, equitable economic recovery from the pandemic. Um, now they're going to spam, I want to say that this will not be a panel to the truth of advertising, a channel of debate about the, the um, Charter Reform Commission, although we'll have some conversation about some of the aspects of that. We're going to take a broader look at, again, at government reform in the Portland area. Um, 
And it, the panelists will include in their presentation a reflection on the value of an urban university like Portland State University uh, and what that can contribute to governmental reform and to civic life. Thank you for being here. And we're going to start with Carl Abbott. OK, thanks. So I'm the historian in the crowd. So I get to go back more than 100 years um, and then move us forward. Um, so basically, I want to briefly talk about two different two past eras of political structural reform in Portland. One that brought us the um, commission form of government that we're now concerned with, and the other which brought us, among other things, the Office of Neighborhood Associations, which morphed into community life. So, um, so the first era, very beginning of the last century, um, Portland in the early 1900s, it's ambitious, it's prosperous, and it's politically corrupt. Um, it had ambitions to be recognized as a peer of older cities like St. Louis or Philadelphia, um, not just a crude outpost in the far west like Seattle obviously was. Um, so, for example, it staged the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition to prove it could do something big. And it hired eminent planners like John C. Olmsted and Edward Bennett from East Coast places to come and help Portland plan to be as sophisticated as Chicago or Boston. Um, most prestigious planners money could buy. Um, prosperity. There was a population boom, new neighborhoods, real estate boom remade the city core in the early 20th century. Um, services for Northwest farm and forest industries, you know, fueled the economy, factories to process the wheat and the cattle and the wool and the wood that the hinterland produced. So prosperity, money, population growth, but also corruption. There was, the city was run by a Republican party political machine that was based in working class and immigrant districts, mostly in the, you know, the fringes of downtown. Um, mayors and ward councilmen were, were in the pocket of the bosses, partly funded by gambling and prostitution rakeoffs. You know, very standard early 20th century, you know, machine politics. Um, well, voters got were, were frustrated, and you know, nineteen seven or so, they elected Harry Lane, a reform mayor, who's going to set things straight. But a reform mayor without a reform council doesn't do much. Uh, so he was frustrated. Um, not much happened. Um, you, know, you vote the rascals out, but they've got staying power, and the rascals came right back. Um, there was a vice commission report in 1912 about the prostitution and gambling and about how you know, rich families in Portland were, were, all, you know, were benefiting from that by owning all the real estate in which all this stuff was going on. Um, and then in 1913, the Bureau of Municipal Research, a private research organization from New York City came and did a scathing report about Portland municipal government. And that finally triggered the um, Portland Reform, which is kind of the progressive members of the uh, civic commercial leadership in the city, say, we've got to do something about this. And there were, at that time, two options about how to change, how to make a more progressive city government. One was to have a city manager. The other was to have the commission form of government that had been pioneered in Galveston, Texas. And at the, in 1913, it, it was not clear who was going to be which was going to be the winner. Now we know city manager would have been a better choice, but 1913 they didn't know that. So there was a measure on the ballot. Um, it passed by a margin of 772 votes out of tens of thousands. So if um, 362 people had voted differently in that election we would not have gotten the commission form of government. So your vote counts. Everybody in this room knows that, but just in case your vote counts. Um, 
who voted for commission government? The new middle-class neighborhoods on the east side. Um, you know, Laurelhurst and Irvington and the Grant Park area and Silwood and East Moreland, um, all those nice, or still, you know, nice neighborhoods who voted against, and, and some of the West Hills <clears throat> who voted against it, working class districts. Um, so, and then four years later, the what I call the conservative nature of this reform was reaffirmed in the mayor election when you know, mayor when George Baker defeated Will Daly. Will Daly was um, a labor leader who was also a socialist, which was not a good thing to be in 1917. Um, and George Baker was a businessman who went on to serve four terms as mayor. Um, he was very popular, not necessarily the best mayor we've ever had. Um, so what are my takeaways from this first era? Number one, commission government at the time was a good progressive idea at the time. Number two, it was a response to problems of ineffective government and visible disorder. And three, essentially conservative in the sense that served the interests of the middle class and progressive members of the business community. Um, and in many ways, that's who commission government has continued to serve to the present day. Well, let's fast forward 50 years. Um, past World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the arrival of the baby boom babies and the, to the, back up to the mid 1960s. We find another era of ferment and change now with the beginnings of input from Portland State University. I couldn't find anything about Portland State back in 1917, 1913, unfortunately. Even hard to try, you can't find it back there. But in the, in the late 60s, played a role. Um, what are the challenges? Um, well, reform, there had been a reform mayor, Dorothy Lee, who had been stymied by city council cronyism. Um, Corruption scandals in the mid 1950s uh, brought Bobby Kennedy to, to, to the you know, leading um, as chief counsel for the McClellan Commission, which investigated corruption in Portland city government and ties with the Teamsters, Dave Beck's Teamsters Union, um, gave Portland exactly the wrong kind of publicity. Um, there were racial inequalities and tensions um, because of the, the African-American population increase from World War II that the city had not been able to, white Portland had not been able to figure out how to deal with that. Suburban flight of the middle class, classic American story, uncoordinated regional services that plagued every growing metropolitan area at the time. So how did we reform government? Well, we got Metro, that's one thing. You know, we got a regional government that's been in many ways remarkably effective um, and certainly innovative um, with an elected council, still this you know, Portland you know, progressive innovation adopted by tri-county voters in uh, 1978, came out of proposals developed by a local government, tri-county local government commission that was chaired by PSU professor Ron Cease. Um, and it sub substantially supported that commission effort was substantially supported by PSU with in-kind kind of contributions and et cetera. So, you know, Portland State played a significant, not the key and pivotal role in the creation of Metro, but certainly a very important role. Um, and then we have, if that's the regional level, what about the city itself? what I call Portland's neighborhood revolution, um, the late 60s and early 1970s. You had neighborhood activists in all over the city sort of bubbling, activism bubbling up at about the same time. Um, Northwest District Association, you know, fighting expansion, hospital expansion and uh, 
you know, bit, you know freightliner expansion. Um, you had the development of Southeast Uplift and the neighborhood associations in, in you know, inner Southeast Portland. You had a younger professional middle class who wanted to preserve older neighborhoods and downtown because some of them had read Jane Jacobs and they sort of thought that's what you should do. And as one of those told me, um, went on to prominent positions in the state, we got tired of protesting the Vietnam War, nothing happened. So we thought may maybe Portland was more tractable than the national government. Um, so we got things. So this is the this is the the source of the freeway revolts, the the end of Harbor Drive, you know, the revolt against the mounted, you know, the so-called mounted freeway, um, which luckily then made it impossible to build the so-called Prescott Freeway, which would have been, which come pretty close to my house, which might not have been there anymore. Um, but at the same time, so this is kind of the white, the younger white middle class, you know, young, young professionals, but you also have black community frustrations boiling over. Um, you have, you know, you have racial tensions, you have a Black Panthers chapter, um, whose history has been written very, you know, very with you know very effectively. There's a very good book about it. Um, you have um, you also have the Model Cities program, and the Model Cities program also helped to train a lot of African American leaders um, at the community level. Some of whom went on to significant roles in you know citywide and you know state politics. Um, that was Model Cities was heavily assisted by the Center for Urban Studies at Portland State University with staff leadership going back and forth. And you know, Center for Urban Studies staff helped to craft some of the early novels, Model Cities reports that called out the racism of the Portland School Board and the Portland City Council and the Portland Development Commission to the great fury of the white establishment. Um, and out of all of that neighborhood ferment, one of the results was the development of the Austin Neighborhood Associations established in, in 1974 as a way to systematize that pressure in a very progressive way by opening the doors of City Hall and essentially making people listen. And out of that neighborhood act activism also came a generation of political leaders with a livability agenda. So Neil Goldschmidt, um, Don Clark at the county, uh, Bud Clark, Vera Katz, um, Lloyd Anderson at the city, Mike Lindberg, um, Margaret Strong, Earl Blumenauer, Charles Jordan, who was Model City's director before getting to sit City Hall politics. Um, well, I had the honor of working with on a couple of committees. Um, so a new generation of leadership came out of that. So takeaways, again, after 50 years, problems had continued to pile up and pile up and pile up until things just had to change. And the leader, the most of the leadership came from the progressive white middle class but the black activism was also very important. So after another 40 years, here we are. And um, 40 years of government stability, repeated rejection of changes in city government, um, problems seem to have built to a critical mass. Um, for most voters thinking that it ain't broke, so don't fix it, to many now convinced that it's broken. Um, and that's happened, that change happened pretty quickly. Um, it's like the kaleidoscope shifted and suddenly things look, look different. Um, the activists now come from communities of color and from white progressives, as in that 1965 to 80 era, but from a much more diverse city where racism, gentrification 
and representation are now front and center and where communities of color are a much larger percentage of the city population, a voice that, that cannot be ignored in a way that might have had in previous generations. There's also anger from middle-class neighborhoods in the early 20th century about issues of public order, street camping, trash, crime. Um, so some final takeaways. Dissatisfaction, reform, 50 years of superficial stability and masking mounting problems, an era of change, and maybe the same thing over about four decades. And then I think we're in a new era of change, whether it happens in a couple of weeks or whether it happens in a year or two, but we're in that era of change. And the dissatisfaction of the 2020s, it seems to me has a wide base that combines the kind of concerns that people had in the early part of the century and the concerns that also people had in you know, the 1960s you know, and 70s. Um, both the homeowner constituency and perhaps more progressive interests and communities of color combining, I think now in a way that they'd been separate in earlier eras. And I'm the historian, I got us up to this year. It's time for me to stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner, would you like to? Sure. Um, well, the, Dr. Abbott, thank you so much for grounding us uh, uh, um, so expertly um, in the history and stories that got us to this moment. Um, and I just want to uh, start by sharing some personal reflections. It's great uh, to be back at PSU amongst uh, um, a distinguished uh, a group of scholars. I'm a political scientist myself. In fact, I used to teach in this very program in this very building. Um, and it's wonderful to be back here. Um, Michael and I both work for the city of Portland. In fact, if you go back to where my previous job before being on council, um, I was um, a staff person over in the Office of Civic Life. And one of the reasons why I was a staff person over at the Office of Civic Life is because I, I believe that the work that Michael does uh, promoting civic engagement is some of the most important work that you can do um, in um, American politics and civic politics. Uh, I'll also point out that when I had that job, um, one of the things I did was to be head of the neighborhood association system. And I think I know some of the folks in the room from uh, my back, my old neighborhood association days. And again, um, um, the um, neighborhood association system, I think, has been uh, for do 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 past 40 years or so critical to both, um, I think, Portland's self-conception, how we've organized ourselves as communities to solve problems and talk about problems. Um, I would also argue that many of the tensions that we see out in the streets today um, reflect um, history moving on. Uh, the neighborhood associations came out of a time and moment, um, and this is a different time and moment. And I think one of the interesting things is um, why um, why the neighborhood association system, to, which is an re important reform of the 1970s, um, is under so much criticism today. And I think that's a re an urban reform story, too. Um, and then again, I agree with Dr. Abbott. I think that today's current moment um, is the beginning of a new era um, in urban reform. And maybe I can share some thoughts about what this moment um, is about and where we're going um, and how we um, hopefully will um, rise to the challenges of this moment so we can build a better city. And I will um, um, do a spoiler alert, alert. I would argue that Portland State is um, a big part of the solution for um, the problems that we're facing today. You know, I think we're we're uh, very much trying to grapple with issues of equality um, and um, engagement and higher education, especially urban higher education, um, could not be a more critical player um, here. Um, and what I thought I might do in my um, informal com comments today is uh, to maybe take a look or accept and embrace the historical framework that um, Dr. Abbott shared with us, um, maybe provide a little bit more context on some of the um, 
previous reform moments that we've seen in the past, the early 1900s when we saw Portland embrace the commission form of government, that early 1970s when we saw the neighborhood association system emerge, and um, we get to this current moment when we're thinking about um, embracing a very different kind of government too. Um, I think it's really fair to say and appropriate that we started uh, this discussion about uh, PSU and the life of the city by uh, going back to the early 1900s. That's when we adopted our current charter. So it's been around for uh, 100 years. You should think about that charter as being uh, the constitution for our city. Um, and uh, we at that moment, we embraced the commission form of government, which at that time was a very new concept. Um, it emerges from um, an experiment launched in Galveston, Texas, and I think 1911, something like that. Um, we often, um, sometimes you'll hear that, that factoid, but I think it's important to um, know the backstory for why Galveston embraced the commission form of government. Um, and for those of you who uh, really like to dig deep, you'll remember that Galveston at that time got hit by a devastating hurricane town is basically wiped out um, and they have to start over um, and it's chaos and their uh, uh, and the strategy that they embraced to kind of try to rebuild the city was to literally set up I don't know how many people served on their council but five different mayors uh, uh, basically you were the mayor in charge of rebuilding the water bureau and you're the mayor in charge of reinventing the fire bureau and you're the mayor in charge of housing, although they probably didn't have a housing bureau back then. And you could, and Michael can be the mayor in charge of, um, of, uh, of parks, let's say. Um, and Portland adopted that model, but it's uh, a few years later, um, Portland adopted that same model. But intriguingly, um, you know, Portland didn't adopt that commission form of government because we're trying to re recover from a natural disaster. Instead, we adopted that model because we were really pissed off at the mayor. Um, and why were we pissed off at the mayor? We were pissed off at the mayor because City Hall was uh, um, corrupt. And so the, I think the initial um, embrace of the commission form of government was designed to kind of tie the mayor's hands. Um, now they say that history does not repeat itself, but it sometimes rhymes. Um, I would argue that uh, uh, if you take a look at the subtext of current um, urban reform debates, um, Part of what's driving that is a suspicion of the mayor uh, um, and a, sort of a desire to curtail the mayor's power. Um, and I don't, I won't make any judgments as to whether that's fair or not, but I do think it is a true observation um, that Portlanders have a, a couple of common characteristics. You know, we love this city, you know, we love the Blazers, we can tolerate the rain, um, and we just have an innate suspicion of mayors. And I suspect no matter what we do and how we will reorganize our governments, that will probably stick with us. Um, I also want to share another reform story, which I just kind of put together relatively recently, uh, which uh, um, I think actually explains a lot of this, of why Portland looks the way it does today, it kind of comes out of the, the early 1900s. Um, but also, um, explains this, I'm sure you have walked around Portland, um, and seen people living underneath bridges um, and gone like, this is both infuriating and odd and why does this happen? And I'll tell you, I've served on Portland City Council um, and I've seen people live under bridges and I've asked myself like, why does this happen? And what, let's just pick it up, let's, let's fix this. Um, but what you'll quickly discover is in the Portland metro area, a lot of the bridges are not owned by the city of Portland. They're actually owned by other government entities, often the county. And the county piece is particularly puzzling because if you know a little bit about how our governments are organized, um, the county, you know, the city directly does infrastructure. Yes. I'm the sewer guy, I'm the water guy. Why does the county, and the county does mental health, why do they, why does the county um, also have a, like the Hawthorne Bridge and whatnot? Um, and the, the answer to that question, and here's why it matters, is because I'm the I'm the city guy who should be able to go in and clean up underneath bridges, but because the county owns the bridge and therefore controls the space underneath the bridge, if I want to go in and intervene with the people living underneath the bridge, we have to have an intergovernmental agreement with the county that figures out, which lays out how all this is going to work, and that is incredibly complicated and takes many 
many years and you know, thousands of hours of staff time and frankly, millions of dollars. Um, how did we get this way? Well, back in the early 1900s, uh, as we've heard before, Portland was very corrupt. And um, the, the uh, people of Portland decided Portland is too corrupt to trust with the, with the work of building bridges. So we'll just give it to uh, a, a different government. At the time, the county was perceived to be uh, um, less corrupt. Um, and that is why today, um, that is why today uh, the county owns a lot of our older bridges. And frankly, you know, I tell that story both because it's interesting, but also today we live with the consequences of that reform, right? Now we have these overlapping jurisdictions where it makes it really difficult for, port, or for public agencies to come together to uh, solve a, a common problem. And that, um, that instinct um, or that solution, which Portland has embraced over and over again, and it's a very American uh, um, solution, is to kind of uh, try to um, try to uh, limit corruption by uh, building in lots of checks and balances, right? That's kind of the Portland way of doing things. Um, but it also that also comes with some uh, um, challenges. One of the challenges is it makes it awfully hard for government to be efficient. So I wanted to share that with you. I think there are lots of lessons there. One of the lessons is, is that the um, consequences of the reform choices that we make today um, are very likely to impact our great-great-grandchildren uh, who will live here in 2021, 22, um, 100 years from now. Um, and it, instead of uh, people living under bridges and like the city government might not be able to deal with that, it may be people living in hovercrafts and how we go about uh, regulating ho hovercrafts and, and whatnot. Um, I also want to, um, and now let's uh, fast forward to uh, um, 60 years or so um, and talk about this moment that uh, Dr. Abbott, Abbott reminded us of, which is that late 60s, early 70s moment when uh, Portland established its uh, neighborhood association system. Um, and just as uh, being suspicious of the mayor, I think, is um, baked into the DNA of Portlanders, I think um, neighborhoods are also, are, are also baked into the DNA of Portlanders. And indeed, I would argue that the DNA of Portland is actually neighborhoods. Uh, we're in a city of neighborhoods. We kind of come together um, we form a city by uh, uh, um, coming together as a series of villages, all of which is distinct and care and um, and charming in its own way. We heard how the neighborhood association system was invented as a way to empower um, grassroots Portlanders, um, a way for to give them a voice in city hall. Um, I'll take you back to this moment because, um, amazingly, I'm old enough to kind of remember this. You know, um, you know, neighborhood associations when they first emerged really were quite powerful and quite important. There were a way that people could come together um, and influence uh, um, city hall. I would argue that they had a uh, um, a big influence on uh, Portland, creating some of our best public policies. If you go back to what we were doing and the uh, really innovative stuff we were doing in the 70s and 80s and 90s around environmental stuff, having a walkable city, having a bikeable city, all of that came from that moment. Um, and as the guy who used to um, be in charge of running that program, um, I'll tell you, um, that is a model for civic engagement, which is admired um, around the world. Uh, back when I was um, helping run that, we would literally have delegations from Japan, uh, the Nordic countries, um, other, you know, everywhere uh, um, across this nation to kind of come to see how Portland um, organized its neighborhood association system. Um, but for those of you who have been around Portland for a couple of decades, you also know that our city has evolved um, really significantly in uh, recent decades. You know, the 70s, um, yeah, I was here in the 70s. And I remember what Portland was like. We were still a timber town. You know, we used to store logs in the Willamette River uh, uh, before you floated them down to the uh, uh, sawmills. Uh, and there were kind of moments and times where you could almost walk from one edge to one edge of the river to the other edge of the river across the log rafts. Um, I can recall, 
taking uh, TriMet down, it must have been the 14 Hawthorne bus in the um, early 1980s. And there would literally be loggers um, on the TriMet bus. They come into town to get, kind of have a good time and take the bus around. Um, and of course, we don't see many loggers anymore. Um, and uh, of course, that moment was also, Portland was much less diverse. You know, um, I was certainly one of the few people of color, or felt like I was one of the few people of color in town, although there were thousands uh, uh, of other folks here. Um, uh, um, so I think one of the things that I observed during my time at Civic Life um, is that model of the uh, neighborhood engagement or organized around neighborhood associations did encounter tension as a couple of things changed. Uh, one, we became a more diverse city, so our neighborhoods were, um, you know, we had more people of color, more immigrants, frankly, fewer homeowners, um, and I think that made a big change. Um, and a lot of the, I think, current moment that we're uh, um, 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 struggling with right now is how do you promote civic engagement how do you promote civic engagement um, through the neighborhood association system when a lot of people don't own homes or you know people work whatever hours? It's just a different model, and also and how do you um, and also the one of the things is it's not just uh, it's also the concern that uh, the being able to access homes. Uh, you know, I think if you go back. I think I go back and think of my neighbors from twenty or thirty years ago. Um, who maybe in many ways might have been low functioning in some ways, maybe had alcohol problems or drug problems, but they still had like a little home, 42nd and Holgate. Uh, um, you could still kind of afford to do that on a working person's salary, um, something that's not here today. So I think there's a lot more um, economic instability here. There's a lot more tension. Uh, folks feel like they can't um, sort of access the infrastructure that neighborhood associations rely upon. Um, which uh, uh, um, is one of the things which I think has destabilized uh, um, the neighborhood association system, which is what I think was also quite important to the city. And I think if you kind of roll that forward to a decade, it also gets us towards our current moment. You know, we all know we have a charter reform um, on the ballot. Um, there are two major pieces here. Uh, one, um, one of the pieces is to hire a city manager. This was the first the original debate, uh, as we talked about, you know, do we, the, in 1911, the question is, do we hire a city manager or do we go with the commission formed government? Um, they decided to hire a city man, or we decided to go with a, a commission form of government and, you know, we'll let the rest is, is history. Uh, there's a second piece of um, this charter reform proposal, um, which deals with how you go about electing members of council. And this is the, I think everyone agrees at this point that the, that we should hire a city manager. Um, the controversial piece of the charter reform proposal, um, and I would argue that this is a current, we're in a new moment in terms of chart of um, urban reform. Um, and this is what the, the package on the November ballot is, is responding to. Um, there's an electoral package, and uh, you probably, some of you, especially if you read the papers and follow this, you've heard me talk about how the um, electoral piece is unique here. Basically, they're proposing to take, use multi member districts um, in combination with um, single transferable votes systems to choose a 12 member council. Um, I, I don't want to get into all the debates about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I, I do, what I will do is kind of um, get, share with you my, um, my understanding of what the Charter Reform Commission was trying to get at with the electoral things, which is to make a council that is more responsive and representative uh, to, to people, which kind of gets back to this problem that we were talking about a minute ago, where, um, you know, our traditional form and mechanisms for uh, civic engagement, let's say neighborhood association systems, uh, feel a little obsolete for the current moment. Um, and so uh, we have a charter reform commission, which is, um, and you can tell as a former political scientist who literally taught things like multi-member districts and uh, ranked choice voting, you can tell they're taking ideas that they encounter in um, in our political science and history classes and trying to apply them to the moment. And the, even though I disagree with the polls on the table, I am kind of proud with the, of them for uh, uh, of their uh, creativity here. Um, but I think that's, you know, I think that's what uh, this moment is about. I think uh, uh, Dr. Abbott was completely correct that there, this is a new uh, um, moment 
and urban reform. How it will play out, we still don't know. Um, I think there are two, um, several um, tensions here. Um, you know, I think this current moment is be, is is organized around this tension between wanting, you know, a more efficient government. I think we all see seven thousand people sleep, sleeping on the streets and go, "Why the heck can't we do better than this?" Um, for those of you who want to make a reform or like, you know, add an addition to your house or something like that, they're trying to get a permit out of city hall and it takes a year. You're like, "We just got to do better than this." At the same time, notice this other tension in the room, which is, um, you know, Portlanders also want to have government which is uh, more representative, more reflective of who we are. Um, I would pause it. I hope this isn't um, a mathematical truth, but it's probably a, a probabilistic, like, uh, it's highly probable that. Um, there is tension between having efficient government and having uh, a government that reflects uh, um, us, right? That's kind of like the House of Representatives, the different, you know, the House of Representatives has lots of voices in it. Uh, it's also always kind of chaotic. On the other hand, um, if you just want to um, build roads efficiently, um, you know, Robert Moses was great at that, but there were problems with Robert Moses. You know, so I think this is the challenge of the moment, although it's, and it's interesting, Robert, I, was, I just discovered this relatively recently, Portland um, um, hired Robert Moses to uh, be a consultant to come in and help uh, plan uh, our highway system. We didn't actually implement his plans because we couldn't fund the money in very typical city hall fashion, but uh, um, a lot of his ideas uh, came through, and but a lot of them did not come through. We didn't do the imminent domain stuff that he was his bread and butter. Um, I'll wrap up by saying this, you know, so we are in this new reform moment. I think the, the new reform moment um, shares lots of things with us past, you know, certainly the suspicion of the mayor remains kind of uh, uh, with us today. Um, I think there's a desire for more efficient government, which also is in tension with, um, you know, um, our desire to be more democratic and representative um, and equitable. Um, one question is, how do you, um, how do you um, square this circle? And I think one of the ways that you square this circle is with the opportunities um, that emerge by embracing um, education and dialogue that you see um, at urban universities like PSU. And with that, why don't I, um, I'll hand the mic uh, um, to uh, Michael. Yes. Hey, Michael. All right, looking for these slides. Oh, okay. I got slides. Yeah. I hope that's working. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to learn from each of these distinguished panelists. I'm great hearing you talk. It was wonderful. I've been looking forward to the history of this. So thank you so much. And thank you for your role as the president of an urban university that's so important and vital to the civic life of our city. Um, and I hope for many continued years of that critical role. Um, as a faculty member of an urban university myself, uh, I know how important it is to uh, engage in communities. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you all for, for uh, enduring the next few minutes of my conversation. I want to uh, say that at one point, I'm going to stop and screen share to an, uh, a different file and then come back. So forgive the clunkiness in advance. Um, but uh, I, I thought, what do I title this talk? Uh, reform or reimagine. This is about reforming government. And I, I have these connotations with reform school, and I didn't like that. So I re reimagine. So thoughts on engagement and uh, government. I want to begin with three propositions related to community and engagement. Uh, the first one is engagement in what matters most in one's life is a core indicator of well being. It matters because you matter. The second one is we won't all agree on the meaning of engagement. Some will call it inclusion, participation, uh, whatnot, but we should still try. And the third is the truest test of any system 
are the relationships it enables. Does it empower? Does it breed trust? Does it affirm? Does it make life better? Today, I'll talk about what our office is doing to embrace these three propositions. But before I do, I want to set the stage. Imagine a city where everyone has what they need to thrive, where each neighborhood has a bounty of people working together to support one another. Imagine our neighborhood associations having youth, elders, immigrants and refugees, disabled persons, people from the LBGTQ plus community, renters, owners, houseless, business owners, and government staffers all working together. Imagine that work being built upon the quality of the connection, the quality of the relationships as one of the indicators of success, where newcomers are welcomed because everyone remembers what it's like to be new, what it's like to be an outsider, and what it takes, and that everyone takes responsibility for including all people in that neighborhood and all people who are most impacted by a particular challenge. Imagine a city where everyone knows someone who can give them the answer they need or the resource they need, or to just support them as to get what they need to thrive. A year and a half ago, I was appointed interim director of the Bureau whose people had just gone through a traumatic reorganization. I was tasked by Commissioner Hardesty to stabilize, heal, skill up our staff to address the challenges that seem to perennially keep the Bureau from achieving its mission. The good student I am, ethnographer, anthropologist, I set to reading reports and audits and talking to people. I've worked in community development my entire career, and so set up trying to square where the Bureau and the city is today with where it began and where it could go. I'm still learning, but I've included four, but I've concluded four things that helped me at least explain how we got here. First, the Bureau, for many reasons, has not completely fulfilled its mission. Secondly, there's not agreement on the meaning of engagement. Third, the dozens of dedicated engagement practitioners across all bureaus don't have the support they need and deserve. Fourth, Portlanders are caught in a system of engagement that rewards complaints and disincentivizes collaboration. The resulting distrust makes our current challenges not collective, but a scramble to ensure individual interests are protected at all costs. That's no way to live. That's no way to engage with your government and no way to run a city. Shall I move around a little bit to get the lights to come on? Is, Is that, that what we need to do? Dramatic effect. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. Dancers. Right. The show must go on. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> the good news is that Portlanders are passionate about their city. And I continue to meet employees at all levels whose dedication and diligence has been forged by a lifetime of passion for our people. That in spite of our current challenges, there's more working than that is not. Thank you. You see? There you go. Yes. Let there be light. That's the job of a president. Yes. Yes. In every neighborhood, there are dedicated volunteers <laughs> and workers who've been doing and trying to do what I invited us to imagine in my opening. And they've been doing it for years. In every bureau, there are amazing people making smart decisions, pushing forward smart solutions, which includes reaching out to the communities because the community knowledge matters most to them. And still, we're at an inflection point when it comes to collectively coming up with a way to work together. To address the four challenges, Civic Life has launched what we call the Portland Engagement Project. Now, PEP, as we call it, is not a redux of community connect of 2008 report or the Portland Comprehensive Plan for 2035 and beyond. Those two plans involve thousands of Portlanders and contain a vision of engagement for all Portlanders that if fulfilled would enable us to continue to be the envy of cities across the globe. The PEP is designed to align our city with those two plans. It contains five main sub projects. One, begin with good data. And now I pause for a bit of uh, screen toggling maneuver. In addition to drawing upon these two plans and other reports I don't have time to discuss today, and one I learned about just a few minutes ago, Civic Life hopes to create data rich profiles that are accessible and user friendly for anyone who cares about our 95 neighborhoods. This slide shows the kinds of data we have wrangled to fit into our neighborhood boundaries. 
We have a proposal at council next week to complete this important work so our city and its engagement innovators can draw upon the most current data available. These include demographics, voting, crowding, rent burdens, education, language, and so much more. It also shows how much our neighborhoods have changed in each neighborhood over the past 10 years. I know that some of our neighborhood associations are already using this data to do business differently, and so are some of our nonprofit partners. This work, as the slide shows, was carried out by our partnership with PSU's Population Research Center, and I want to especially thank Ethan Shigarin and Cindy Chen for their amazing work to get this project this far. Number two, don't reinvent the wheel. The Community Connect Report of 2008 and the Comprehensive Plan offer community-based collaboratively developed frameworks for improving our engagement with our residents. The Community Connect Plan of 2008, for example, uh, included in it under Mayor Potter, mm -hmm. funding for the Immigrant and, Ref and Refugee Program, for the Youth Programs, for the Disability Program, and grants for leadership development for new and emergent leaders, as well as for civic dialogues between and within our communities to support us all to be able to connect with one another respectfully. The talented people who worked on those plans drew upon research from the PSU and elsewhere, community vision, and a hope for a future where all Portlanders are included and engaged in the decisions that most impact their lives. But we're not alone in this effort. Cities across the world have been grappling with how to manage such massive urban, changings to our, urban changes to our economies, infrastructure, cultures, and climate. The second thing we're proposing is to bring together local and national engagement leaders, innovators, and practitioners to publicly share their experiences and renew our understanding and vocabularies of engagement. How you think often shapes how you act. We hope council will approve our proposal to work with PSU's Center for Public Service and Oregon's Kitchen Table to design that convening sometime in 2023. The third part is that we must collaborate with implementers, those charged with implementing any government services. Since good ideas need talented people to carry them out, we began listening to our bureau staff and all city employees. We contracted with a consulting firm pregame to design our employee listening through which we received hundreds of solutions oriented ideas. Seven and a half percent of all city employees participated in, from over 37 bureaus and work teams. We will have these results and results of everything else I talk about today on our website within a week or two. Additionally, to support our dedicated engagement practitioners from all bureaus, we've launched a renewed support and resource network for them. Among other things, this will include an intensive training on community trust building and legitimacy based on the lessons from other cities across the nation and world. We're designing that scope of work currently with a nonprofit consulting group called the Center for Public Impact. Finally, you must engage all Portlanders. In order to reset Community Connect 2008 and the Comprehensive Plan of 2035, Pregame is designing a listening process for all Portlanders that we hope to launch in early 2023. Like the listening of city employees, this future-oriented project will include every solution that we hear for us all to see. They are designing the listening process to ensure what our youth tell us and what our civic leaders tell us and what our community groups tell us anticipates the future of our city so that our plan isn't obsolete the moment it is complete. Pregame is just beginning to design our listening apparatus for all Portlanders. And for those who worry, of course, it will include our current civic leaders from neighborhood associations, nonprofits, as well as individuals. Why would it not? Everything I've spoken about today will be on our website. Here's the definition of engagement. Sorry. That's <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Electronic engagement included. Uh, yeah. And I wanted to show you this. Everything that I've spoken about today will be on our website, and here is the, the, the URL. So in keeping with the theme of this panel, what does this all have to do with government reform? I hope my remarks have made obvious the important role community plays in creating a city and a world where we all want to live and where we all belong. Engagement is about a relationship built on trust, mutual support that is affirming and collaborative. Reimagining our city, okay, reforming our government, without meaningfully including the visions, the voices of our work, 
of our wonderfully diverse communities would be a colossal mistake. Imagine a city where everyone belongs, where people and their government work on solutions of common concern together. I want to offer my thank yous to Civic Life staff who continue to do amazing work to Commissioner Hardesty, to Portland State, to civic leaders new and old, and to all of you. Thank you. Well, what, what an interesting conversation. And I found myself trying to listen and find the alignment. And so one of the things that came to my mind, perhaps strangely, is friction. It looks as if we have had reform of one form or another when there's been a friction. That is where there is friction could be defined political side by perhaps growing dissatisfaction in the community with the life quality and what was happening in the community and then beginning to hold government responsible for that. And so I think one thing, this is going to be an analogy that you may not grow with, but the, the, the friction then eventually gets oiled and then the system then jolts its up out of turn up beyond you know, comes from it. So hopefully not taking that too far. Um, the just the friction originally a lot of was corruption in the sense of the, the, the uh, inefficiency and the damage and the harm from corruption and that led to uh, that friction getting big enough to then we're going to make a change but we just don't make incremental changes in Portland apparently we picked the, the new the new really innovative idea which was the commission form of government which interestingly enough tends to fuse the legislative and executive functions which is really what's rather unique about that among other kinds of local government government types is that the basically the the legislators are also executives and uh and and performing both of those roles together fast forward a bit then the friction becomes about um coordination of services wanting to aspire to a bigger community uh understanding that we some of our problems were more local and some were more regional and uh that major thing we didn't just do, do something incremental we created and i believe the only elected the only regional government created by popular election in history. I think that's still true. Is that why I'm not correct? Um, so that was pretty bold, right? Fast forward now and the friction has tended to be about a uh, lack of representation, racial justice, equity, major social issues and problems and respecting government to handle that. And again, we've come up in our uh, charter reform movement with some very interesting creative out of the box thinking. So when, when we, when, apparently when we get enough friction, we get excited, we do something and it's relatively bold. And, and, and to Michael's point, again, seeing that the neighborhood group and the organizational work and the community building that comes out of it, having accomplished some things, but wanting to do more, aspire to be greater, and then that doing some really creative thinking about how that could look different. So I just appreciated that and I began to think, but I love the way that you've taken us from the past of our history brought a future forward of some things that are happening now. So I appreciate that. I'm going to give just a minute or two if any of you would like to say something back and forth, and then we're going to open it up to our audience. And I believe we have the possibility of audience uh, participation from the electronic world, which we have right now. Well, I'll, I'll share a thought with, uh, um, that emerged, uh, that came to me as Michael was giving his uh, very helpful presentation. Um, and Michael was talking about some his data project, which is coming up, and we should all, I encourage you all to take a look at when uh, it goes live. When's it going to go? So there'll be a live portion of the data project coming up soon? Well, all of the pieces of the uh, Portland Engagement Project will be on our website in the next week or two. Yep. As much as we have to date, we're still yep. early in the process. The, uh, the maps are already there. Great. The neighborhood profiles are already on the website. If you, you can go and Take a look at them. They're not, they're technical beta versions, so they're not quite ready yet. Um, we're hoping to then this year continue our work with the Population Research Center to make that searchable database, to make them user friendly. And we've been gathering for the past two months, uh, actually all through the summer, uh, input from our neighborhood associations and community groups about how we can make those uh, neighborhood profiles even more useful. Well, uh, um, excellent. I look forward to checking all of that out. And as Michael was uh, presenting on that, I was thinking back back to the ordinance uh, uh, that authorized this. Uh, and I was remembering little pieces of it. And I was remembering the PSU piece to it, uh, um, where I, I think we contract with PSU to help get the data out, uh, which just got me thinking a little bit about um, the business that I encounter as a member of city council that involves BSU. And um, most of the ordinances that come to council 
um, that involve PSU are data projects like this where, and I do it as the water, as the water commissioner and the sewer commissioner, I need data and data projections about what our population is going to look like decades into the future, because I have to build um, sewer systems and water systems that will hopefully last a, a hundred years. Uh, but, you know, there are, the police bureau has a, a very similar data needs. I think you could go through almost every bureau, bureau um, and we have, or many of our bureaus have uh, um, contracts with PSU, which I thought was interesting. And there's a common theme that goes there. I mean, I think the city of Portland turns to PSU as we try to get a better picture and understanding of ourselves. And I, um, I'm sitting here right now um, on this Friday afternoon, kind of pondering that, um, very special role that this um, important public institution uh, plays. And I want to thank, thank uh, the president and all my colleagues here at PSU for uh, what you do for the city of Portland. Um, you literally help us see ourselves. Shall we open up to the audience for questions or comments? <clears throat> Let's not be like the first day of class. Yeah, okay. I know. Please go ahead. I just have a um a question from the historic end of things, um, which is I have never learned about what role PSU played in the development of our statewide land use planning system. I happen to move here in 71 and staffed the organization in Wayne County um, in 75, starting in 75. So I'm very aware of the fact that we created neighborhood systems and it is like in the counties of different rural county organizations across the state in response to statewide land use planning goals. And I just wonder what kind of role PSU played at those tables um, in the late 60s and early 70s when Senate Bill 10 and Senate Bill 100. Well, I think I'm going to repeat the question just a second. Thank you. For the question in the 60s and the 70s, what role did Portland State University play in land use planning and other things and the statewide level, and even though we've been talking about local level? Well, that's what gave rise to right. the whole and, and the man who wrote, who's written the book about that is hiding back there in the corner. Sai is better qualified to answer that than I am. Sai, would you like to jump, come up here and join us for a moment? We're a very open panel, very inclusive. Yes. yes. He has written two books about it. See, join the panel. Yeah, participatory democracy. Exactly. Very. Yes. So there were people here at Portland State who were actively involved in, for example, shaping the goals. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And well, as Carl mentioned, people from our Center for Urban Studies were very, very actively involved early on in all manner of activities at the local level, at the regional level, and at the state level. Uh, there was a time when CUS was considered a think tank for the local progressive community. I mean, one aspect of the uh, reform movement, Carl mentioned city manager, commissioner, uh, was nonpartisan. Uh, many of the reform movements led to nonpartisan governments. And so that was an issue that was discussed as well at the local level and at the regional level is whether or not people running for office ought to run as members of parties rather than. The fact that the goal one of that extensive, you know, state land use reform citizen engagement and, and you know, like whose vision, whose, was it, did they do that to convince people it was safe to vote for this or to have the legislature adopt it or, I mean, that's, that was a pretty bold step to be allowing people to have the right to comment on things that were going to impact them. Well, that's right. But I think it also reflected, as Carl was talking about, an explosion of interest in community-based activism during the latter 1960s and early 1970s, war on poverty-related, model cities-related. And so citizen, citizen, but the word is also relevant, right. reflecting its time. Yes. 
but nevertheless, the notion of engagement in policymaking processes, in giving input to the plans that were going to be required by every local government in the state, city and county. So yes, that was very much a critical dimension of introducing these innovations. So there has to be bottom up sort of processes and engagement with folks when uh, Senate Bill 100 passed and set up LCDC to develop goals. The goal development process during 1974 was in itself an intensively engagement process all around the state. What was interesting, I think, about that engagement process was when they went to uh, Central Oregon and had a meeting, you asked people, what do you think about the coast? And when you were on the coast, you also asked people to think about, well, what about the Columbia River Gorge? And so it was an intentional effort to encourage people to think about a statewide approach to things. But then similarly at the, whether it's the regional level or the city level, to encourage the folks who you are wanting to participate to think about it as well in broader terms, not just what's happening in their backyard on their street, but to encourage people to think in much more bigger picture ways. And I would add that in you know, when Metro was set up with an elected council, it was very deliberate that the districts were not to coincide neatly with existing political boundaries, that they were to cross over city and county boundaries so that somebody would be seen as not the Beaverton representative, but perhaps the West Side, I mean, you're going to have to be the West Side person, but not, you know, not in the old council of government system where you represented, you know, Clackamas County or Beaverton. You know, you had to rep you had to think beyond your own you know, jurisdictional base. Again, trying to make people think, you know, outside the the boundaries that their politics is cu customarily takes place in. Uh, the times are demanding ever increasing decisions by you know, uh, entities of all kinds. And it seems like we rarely know how things are really going to turn out. Charter change is the case of what nobody really knows what would happen if it were passed or not passed. It seems like the part of that challenge is kind of a cultural fear of failure. Uh, from my perspective, failure is the only way back to start anything. And uh, I'm wondering what folks think about how we start to talk more about the notion of trying things, and if they don't work, we try something else, instead of this notion that I got it all figured out and this plan to solve all the problems is what you want to hear. Um, it seems like that really gets in the way of uh, um, getting opportunities to learn by trying things, failing, trying something else, learning each time, and eventually closing in on, on a solution that works at least for a short period of time. Let me see if I can try to verify that there's a lot of entities, no, a lot of entities involved in when you're doing governmental reform and there's a lot of questions about what the result will be and that we may oftentimes have a culture which is a fear, a uh, cultural fear of failure. And so we think we always have to get it right the first time rather than saying we could try something, we could learn from it. Can we uh, give ourselves the, the room to sort of try new things and be willing to learn from that experience and improve things? And so how do we get over the, the question of the cultural feel of fear of failure? I have, I have a few words on that. Um, engagement is fundamentally about the quality of your relationship and the ability to be generous of heart and mind as we learn together how to solve our problems is one of the fundamental foundational principles of engagement. Um, one of the reasons why I have learned a lot working with the Center for Public Impact as we're having a conversation about how to support the 50 plus engagement practitioners who are working for the city of Portland and all bureaus is because their uh, presentations specifically 
talk about risk taking mm -hmm. and learning. Um, we, we don't want to pay ourselves to learn. And therefore we're afraid to take risks because, and this is not only are we skeptical, we, we are not generous with one another. And this is why the Constructing Civic Dialogues grant program from Civic Life is such an important program because it basically tries to create the space where we can be people before all other things, where we must allow ourselves to learn, to make mistakes, to, to learn from those mistakes, to behave differently, but also learn how to undefend and listen and yield in our connections with one another. Those skill sets need to be learned. And so we're all, as we contemplate government reform and the role of citizen engagement or community engagement in that, must struggle to confront those aspects in our own skill set, our own interpersonal skill set that make it difficult to actually have conversations with people and to hear them. So among the things that I heard in this history was maybe no possibility that the neighborhood association framework was created as a blowback to the civil rights movement and that they were afraid that the racial tensions of the moment were actually going to overtake and overwhelm the city. And so they wanted to create these framework to protect what they had. Don't know whether it's true or not. It's an empirical question. I'm sure we can find out. It had to have been part of what, the, what was part of that conversation at the time, because as Professor Abbott said, racial tension was part of that process in its own way. But really being able to say, is that a fair question to ask? Was it true? Was it not true? And that's not to say that the whole thing is corrupt. It just means there are many histories that are playing into how we got here today and that we need to embrace all of them uh, if we're to move forward in uh, being generous with one another and learning. Thank you for the question. And uh, if I could jump in here, um, <clears throat> I'm tempted to push back a little bit on the premise of the question. Um, as a guy who works at City Hall, I can tell you, uh, we try things and fail all the time. Uh, we're in a big swing down there. Um, and I think, but I also want to also embrace one of the premises of your questions too. Um, I'm okay with failing. Uh, um, I think the problem with failure, uh, especially as it comes in the public space is the, um, is for us to not hold ourselves accountable for our failures and to learn from our failures. And the, in the policy space, this kind of uh, um, boils down to program evaluation, um, evaluating what we do, adjusting uh, um, our policies and our spending uh, accordingly. Um, I, I Frankly, I've been a little bit shocked um, or I, my career kind of oscillates between the academic realm and the uh, and the public realm. Um, every time I go back to the public realm, I'm really surprised at the degree to which um, program evaluation and basically just being data driven um, is not part of the culture. Um, I think that is uh, one of the challenges for um, 20th, early 20th, first century policymakers is to bring these skill sets back in. Um, and I wanted to jump in here because this also um, points to the importance of institutions like Portland State. Uh, um, to have um, uh, rooms like this and institutions like this, which are uh, committed to teaching uh, young people and not so young people, uh, critical thinking skills, evaluation skills. We've heard about uh, the, the vital role that Portland State uh, plays in um, collecting data that the city of Portland uses to understand itself um, is incredibly important. So, you know, one of the things we've talked about here is the, uh, our sub theme of today is, um, you know, the, the past, present, and future of reform, um, which inspires me to also think about the past, present, and future of Portland State University. As I think about the future of Portland State University, I would certainly ask for your partnership in helping uh, develop and uh, spread um, the skills um, and commitment to holding or, you know, program evaluation, which just means being data-driven, holding ourselves accountable, and uh, remaining committed to uh, learning and growing um, every day. So I, I would, you know, a couple of things come to mind in, in response to that question. One is um, 
it's when you have this this kind of pattern that we've been talking about, you wait till there's, you know, you don't experiment when things are going well. But like with the structure city government, you know, people have suggested you know changing before, but it seemed to be okay. So people weren't willing to to try anything. They didn't think it was needed. Now, if now there's much of a sense of urgency and emergency and uh, and you don't dare fail when you're in an emergency. So I think that's one of the one of the tensions. Um, I was also th I was thinking about you know neighborhood associations and I think you know in its early years, first decade or two, I, I believe Office of Neighborhood Associations as a whole was successful. But it does not mean that every neighborhood association within that structure was successful. And there was a lot of experimentation when you have 70 or 80 or 90 organizations, some of which do well for a while and then make mistakes and others of which figure it out um, and originate for different reasons. Northwest District Association, a very different creature than uh, the Irvington Community Association is very different from um, Sowood Borland, you know, Improvement League, you know, they're all different. They all had different origin stories um, and some worked well, some didn't work well. So there's a lot of experimentation when you, when you have a big pool, you know, it's, it's like kind of evolution. Some, some of them get outcompeted. Um, and some of them learn from others. Um, so um, a couple couple responses to you know, to that point. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, part of the issue too is that all of East Portland was annexed in 1988. Yeah. And so they were suddenly jammed into the neighborhood system in the same way that parts of you know their infrastructure and everything else were jammed into the neighborhood, yeah. into the city government. And they never got, they did not evolve or, or as organically as some of the other neighborhood um, neighborhoods had. And they were lumped together. I mean, one of those that, that I can think of off the top of my head has a population of 21,000. You know, yeah. my neighborhood is some, that has a population of 6,000 approximately, and I argue all Johnson Creek is 500 people, as I yeah. recall. <laughs> so when you're trying to run a neighbor association with 21,000 people who have no history of necessarily working in that kind of structure, they end up at a real disadvantage. And um, our city hasn't been you know, fair in terms of the kinds of support that they were able to give. And the evaluation issue, we asked for evaluation many times and there's no money or someone we change staff or we change neighborhood leader and so people forget about it you know and it's, so it's that kind of because i think it's something that we strongly agree with those of us who try to push for kinds of you know, new plans and policies so it's um money is really a, a challenge on both the things that i mentioned you have the resources because you've got an over-resourced neighborhood where the educational level is higher, the income level may be higher, um, the connections that already exist are there, as opposed to a neighborhood where people are looking for jobs and the school may be poor and it's you know, all these other things. So somehow how to equalize that kind of support and what you call it a neighborhood association or you're just thinking community development in general and ever to fund something beyond a year at a time. You know, so that you, this neighborhood can count on, you know, we've got this much of a kind of runway to kind of get some new things going. So the money question rears its head, like how if our community wants engagement, what are we willing to pay for? Um, and how are we going to evaluate whether it's working? And some of it's tricky to evaluate because it's some of the neighborhood work happens kind of like the Fung is it fungus or lichen or whatever that's underneath trees, sort of <laughs> underground and visible. Yeah. There's all kinds of you know communication that happens. Uh, money and time that's saved because someone in a neighborhood knows how to sell the problems. You don't have to go to City Hall, or they can tell you exactly who to talk to as opposed to someone running around from his barn. I'm going to try and summarize that, and, <laughs> and <laughs> but I believe the question began or the comment about 
the city of Portland annexing, annexing, annexing East Portland, bringing the areas into the community that were not well prepared or supported in their efforts to create effective neighborhood organizations that they varied in size and they may not have had the, the same um, social capital in those communities to help them be effective. So I'm going to leave it. That's my best effort to try to do that. <laughs> Carol, you want to? I want, uh, it, this is a, a, a footnote uh, up to our discussion about uh, the neighborhood associations and the histories of neighborhood associations. Uh, one of my loves, I want to do a plug for a uh, PSU uh, PhD, Paul Leisner, which uh, a bunch of you might remember. Uh, he actually was the head of, I took, when he left the city, I actually took over his job. He used to be the head of the neighborhood association system. Uh, uh, I think I, I was the guy who replaced him and he can't really replace Paul. He basically invented that, that thing. Um, and if I recall correctly, he wrote his dissertation at PSU on the history of the neighborhood association system. Yeah. I used to keep a copy of it um, on my desktop when I worked over at Civic Life because it was a really valuable resource. Um, if there are any sort of young people, especially young people who are um, watching online uh, um, right now and are fishing around for good resources for um, the history of Portland, or um, thinking about um, about maybe what the future of civic engagement in Portland looks like, uh, um, we might take take a look at that piece of really excellent yep. Portland State scholarship. Thank and you. Before the library, we probably would have a copy. Yeah, I know we could have like yeah. yeah we did, maybe we'll actually find that. Right there. There. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Aaron, is there anyone online? No. Okay. Okay. Yes. Stuck. I just, if, if I may sure, respond to the sure, last sure. one, uh, thank you for bringing up Paul Leisner. That was the first phone call I made um, yeah. before I started to uh, work on the Portland Engagement Project because I truly believe in building on what works and building on what work that has already been done. Uh, we don't have the time or money to redo things. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely correct that demographically, east of the 205, there is more people than all the West Side combined. And that's a new phenomena. Uh, and we have not accommodated that demographic truth, um, in both linguistically in the funding levels that we give, um, or figured out the organic way to support the different forms of engagement that occur in all sorts of populations. Some of them, it's the corner store. Some of them, it's the restaurant. Some of it's a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a community center, a soccer club. We don't know. And we're, the, the, the vision, the reason why I began with imagine, is just imagine if we found a way to harness that beautiful, bubbling, creative genius that occurs in neighborhood associations and all the other organizations and informal civic leadership opportunities that are out there. We're working on it. We, we haven't figured it out yet, but that's the promise of the Portland Engagement Project. And thank you for bringing up the funding. At some point, I will come to council and I will ask a full throated appeal we'll step for appropriate we'll step funding up. levels to support. Now, I probably won't get all I will call all I want and all that the community has shared is needed, but at least I will be based on what the community has told us. I look forward to that moment. Great. <laughs> Can I throw in one last yeah, thought sure. before we go? Uh, uh, um, this has been so stimulating, and I have. Um, um, uh, you caused many ideas to kind of popcorn uh, around my head. I just want to share with you um, something the city of Portland is thinking about uh, a lot now, especially as we exit the pandemic. Um, and one of the uh, pressing questions we're um, trying to answer right now is how do we get people to return to work? And what, do, what does that look like? Um, and um, as we do that, um, one of the things, at least I'm thinking about, um, is how Portlanders engage with their government. Uh, you know, if you go back two and a half years, um, no one at the city, like when I was at Civic Life four years ago, I'd never took a, I'd never been on a Zoom call, I, I, mm -hmm. quite literally. We wouldn't have had the capability of doing that. Um, and now that is um, unfortunately what I do for eight hours a day. Uh, um, but I think something which is important to recognize is the ways in which we engage with each other and engage with government um, has evolved. Um, I think it's evolved so fast and so subtly that um, we're not particularly mindful of it. 
um, as we think about what the future of um, community engagement looks like, I think it's also important for us to be aware of how civic engagement uh, works current in the modern world. And especially, you know, that was my kid calling early, earlier today. I got a 13 year old uh, and his, his um, his, I, I don't think he's going to relate to a world where you go up to offices and talk to human beings. Although I tell you, I work with a lot of gray haired people like me who are like, people need to be back at their desks so you can go and talk to the, the clerk. Uh, um, and I'm not sure if that's what government is going to look like um, 10 years from now. Or uh, in fact, we know when we actually probe this question, it's not even really what court what civic engagement looks like today. So a thing I would just really plead with the Portland State University community to help um, me policymaker, a policymaker, and I think uh, city government do, um, is to really think about what the future of civic engagement looks like. Because we know um, this is not a static thing. It's not an off or on, uh, on switch. I think civic engagement um, uh, looks different at different moments in history. And I think we saw that maybe with the progressive era uh, um, when we first embraced the commission form of government. And I think it's also true in the late 60s when we embraced the neighborhood association system. Now we're um, in the 21st century with, you know, um, miracle phones and the metaverse uh, uh, looming out there. Um, I don't know how all these things work. Um, but um, I know there are lots of smart people both in this room and watching us um, on the interwebs, uh, um, uh, um, and I look forward to their contributions to um, helping us understand this space. So. Thank you. And appropriate to, to push us into the future thinking we've been historic to current to future. Yeah. Yeah. If you allow me one more friction analogy, there was friction in 1945, six and seven when GIs came back from World War II with a GI Bill and wanted to go. To, to use that opportunity to learn. There were people in our own community who said, I, I, can't, I can't leave to go somewhere else, but I wanna learn here in Portland. And that's what the origins of the creation of the Vanport Extension, Portland State College, eventually Portland State University. It was the flood and we came here, but kind of coming full circle, we just opened the Vanport building. I hope you get a chance to yeah. look in that. We're going back to our roots in an African-American community and a really deeply engaged community. So one of the things that's so pleasant to hear is that Portland State has been involved in these different periods. We weren't, weren't around to help the commission, but, but uh, maybe, but, but certainly we've been involved and we're proud to be part of that and we want to do it. And we're committed at Portland State to make sure we keep finding the ways and the strategies to be there at the table, to show our relevance, to show our humility, to bring our knowledge and value as a true partner and to co-create knowledge and co-create strategies and solutions. So we want to be part of that. So I want to thank Sai for organizing this panel. I want to thank you, my wonderful panelists for a great conversation. I'll ask audience, thank you for coming and let's thank our panel for their great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, that was fun. Yeah. Yes, and thank you to all the panel members, everybody who's here in the room and joining us virtually. Very stimulating conversation. Thanks very much for all the Portland State invitations to contribute. We can raise the asterisk here. It, it works. That is already going on. We live for that. Next uh, session, November 1, about the campus. A university that is in and of its place. Well, here's our place on this campus. So a panel discussion about the campus and its evolution and its future. So again, thank you very much. Well, back to PSU is, owns 14% of the real estate downtown. Well, Technically, goodness. the state does, but we account for 14% of the real estate. Wow. Yeah, I did not know that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you again. Yeah, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Oh, that was so fun.